to join. Um, yeah, I'm just closing my <laughs> email so that I don't receive any notification actually for this hour. <laughs> So I think I we can start with the recording if it's okay for you. Uh, yeah, it's already recording. Right, great. Um, so uh, I think we can give a start again. See uh, people uh, joining and will join uh, soon. So hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our monthly International Development and Innovation Seminar Series here at the Open University. This is the um, second last seminar of the year and we are very excited to have with us today uh, Alessandra Mezzadri, who is a Senior Lecturer in Development Studies at SOAS, uh, School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, University of London. Uh, and uh, Gustav Banirji, who is Associate Professor in Global Study at the School of Affairs and Bedkar University in Delhi, uh, who joined uh, in, in fact from Delhi. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, a very exciting topic, which is a joint work um, um, yeah, undertaken by them uh, recently uh, for the uh, UN uh, wider. And this is the one of the first uh, presentations. So there is like very fresh uh, outputs and findings that um, Ale and um, Gustav will share with us today. So we are very excited and very glad. And thank you again for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, Urban to Rural Labor Transitions from the Factory to Informal Economy. So they will give us a very, very interesting pictures about the, you know, industrial policy, which is a very, um, I mean, core topic for us, but also rural transition and many others inside. So we are very glad to have you um, with us, uh, you guys today. Uh, just uh, a very quick uh, um, housekeeping rules. So the video as usual is being recorded and uh, will be available for play playback after. So people who don't want to be futures can ask questions in the Q&A in the chat box and ask to remain anonymous. Uh, this will be posted uh, very soon by Heidi on our website. Um, you've been now automatically muted, uh, but during the Q&A, if you want to ask questions directly, please raise your hands and um, Heidi will uh, unmute. Um, also, uh, please um, uh, join uh, our newsletter and uh, please follow us on our Twitter to receive notification about our upcoming seminars in events. In um, and the address will be, I think, put in the chat box by Heidi's in dev underscore OU. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I welcome Alessandra and Gustav and uh, I will uh, warn you guys when you have five minutes left. I mean, the talk usually is 40, 45 minutes. Um, there are slides, so I'm sure um, it will be fun. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'll put myself on mute and I'll put my camera. Hello everyone and uh, thanks for the uh, kind uh, invitation and uh, uh, for the kind introduction and it's great to see my uh, research partner and friend uh, uh, Costa as well. Um, I will be presenting but then uh, we will be addressing uh, questions uh, 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 together. Uh, this is uh, uh, quite exciting for us because it's the first time that uh, we get a go at uh, uh, presenting uh, this uh, bout of research, which uh, was uh, uh, is based on a working paper that we uh, uh, wrote uh, for WIDER as part of their program on uh, informal livelihoods and labor transitions. And it is 
a bit, I would say, an outlier in relation to the type of labor transitions that generally wider, as well as many others, uh, development organizations focus their attention on, as we will see that it's, it's a sort of reverse uh, type of transition. Uh, and I hope, in fact, that its uh, interest lies in uh, the mm, sort of quite different uh, issues uh, that uh, uh, it raises. And I put in uh, this first slide uh, the uh, entire reference uh, to the working paper, which has been submitted now um, for consideration to a journal. Now, um, starting with a bit of a background uh, and as someone that has worked um, a fair bit in the last three years, uh, quite unexpectedly, if you ask me on COVID, uh, we've seen that uh, COVID uh, has uh, highlighted and amplified a number of uh, inequalities in the world economy, but he has also worked as this sort of uh, magnifying glass that has exposed uh, a number of uh, tr trends, uh, processes, uh, and issues uh, which are not necessarily in the spotlight uh, uh, all the time. And when it comes to uh, global development studies and economics, uh, in fact, uh, while there's been a great focus on rural urban migration, and we know that from uh, theories of economic growth and economic transition, all the way to the modernizing narratives of development studies. Instead, other types of transitions or perhaps reverse types of transitions have not necessarily been given the same type of attention. Well, COVID fixed that because in a sense, it also triggered one of the most unprecedented uh, uh, urban to rural transitions we have ever seen. And I like to start the talk with this uh, painting uh, of the drawer uh, Hasif Khan, the Indian drawer Hasif Khan, which is quite aptly called social distance. The represent is exodus uh, of uh, uh, workers that leave uh, the urban to actually then rejoin uh, their villages of origins, then moving back uh, to rural areas. And we have seen uh, across uh, international and Indian media these imageries uh, quite strongly throughout, especially the first lockdown called by the Indian government in March 2020. Now, uh, these, uh, 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 but this urban, urban to rural transition, uh, in fact, characterizes the lives of the working poor far more than we generally pay attention to when it comes uh, to theorizations uh, of uh, uh, um, it, it, that that dominate uh, in development economics and development studies. And in a sense, the present uh, uh, research uh, uh, project that uh, uh, sort of uh, inspired us uh, for this uh, uh, specific research was in fact uh, to focus on this particular type of transition, urban to rural, but also uh, factory to uh, non-factory work. Uh, this uh, uh, transition from factory to non-factory work personally has always uh, interests me because uh, uh, what happened to uh, um, labor intensive factory workers when they leave their place of work is a question that is uh, vastly unanswered in the literature. And instead, we will see uh, in a moment is quite uh, important. So what we explore here is, uh, as uh, uh, suggested in the title, the afterlife of industrial work. So what uh, workers are able to do and which occupation they land on and which type of reproductive strategies uh, they have to put forward for their livelihoods when they abandon the factory space. And I would say this is a relevant question for a lot of us working on different type of global supply chains. Uh, of course, I work in textile and garment, but I would say very similar concerns uh, can be raised by those that work in electronics. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we have seen a transformation of global value chains uh, uh, in the last 10 to 15 years towards an increasing buyer drivenness. So also those that were formerly characterized by more capital intensity instead have shifted into in terms of uh, the model of, of, of governance and labor process uh, towards higher intensity of work and hence uh, some of the uh, transformations that uh, uh, we talk about uh, are uh, sort of, of an increasing relevance uh, for them too. Now here, 
this question of what do uh, factory workers do after they end, they finish working in factories is addressed uh, uh, deploying a feminist political economy lens, which in a sense characterized uh, uh, much of my work, but also I would say much of the work of my co-author uh, um, in terms of uh, linkages between uh, 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 work and labor uh, 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 markets as well as livelihoods. Uh, and what we propose here is a life cycle approach to labor, which is premised uh, on social reproduction. Now, the case uh, that we present, and I will just uh, uh, briefly try to sketch for you, is a case of returnee garment workers uh, that leave the national capital region, which is the metropolitan area of Delhi, to move back to their uh, uh, villages uh, and um, uh, towns of, of provenance uh, uh, to Bihar in specific. Um, and in a sense, uh, there is uh, uh, this focus on Biharis uh, makes sense uh, in the context of this study being located in uh, North India uh, and in North India uh, garment uh, uh, um, clusters are characterized uh, by uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, labor force uh, which is composed by male uh, migrants uh, uh, from Uttar Pradesh uh, uh, and Bihar mostly, although we do find uh, sort of percentages from other states, but these are the two main um, sort of uh, um, uh, 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 the, these two states in the Indy Belt are the two main sender of, of labor. So the emphasis, as I said, on, on, on why workers leave the industry, we will see. Uh, so how can we understand the transition they make between the NCR and Bihar, as well as the uh, uh, employment and reproductive strategies uh, uh, they put in place, uh, both structurally, so we will see collected uh, snapshot of their uh, responses, but then we dwell into uh, 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 these more uh, as well. Now, the contributions are quite uh, straightforward. I would say there are several, but for this audience, I think it's interesting to reflect on how this uh, uh, shooting in uh, into the uh, uh, sort of livelihood uh, question of uh, uh, workers leaving an industry as opposed to joining uh, is used here to debunk uh, uh, modernizing narratives of development as a linear journey, as well as uh, in economics, the illusion model. So the idea that you have these transitions whereby you absorb labor from the agricultural sector and uh, the, uh, there is a movement from the rural to the urban and that effectively then uh, sort of is a fundamental phase uh, that sets uh, the development process uh, as a modernizing uh, enterprise. So there are crossovers between uh, the two. Now, when you uh, uh, sort of uh, um, talk about uh, um, transitions uh, in labor markets, uh, that uh, uh, incur between the urban and the rural space, of course, you're talking about uh, migration. In this particular case, uh, we're talking about uh, what in the literature is called as labor circulation. And I would say that uh, uh, if you, again, refer not to just to the literature on uh, uh, garment uh, and textile, but also footwear, electronics, any type of uh, labor intensive production, increasingly uh, a number of uh, capital intensive production uh, as well. There are sort of uh, 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 welcoming a rising number of, of migrant workers. Uh, you can easily spot different types of mobility and different types of uh, labor circulations uh, at work. The first is the classic early circulation that is uh, uh, vastly uh, uh, pictured, uh, uh, particularly by the uh, uh, sort of uh, Chinese uh, 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 comrades, uh, particularly the Hong Kong school has been great in trying to give a snapshot of the type of labor force and the labor regimes characterizing uh, China's uh, industry. You have uh, workers that uh, migrate uh, from uh, uh, rural to urban areas and then they engage in this process of uh, yearly circular migration. In garment in India, of course, this is massively at work. Um, and uh, effectively, uh, in one of the last uh, survey, not for this project, uh, uh, for a previous one, uh, we just uh, highlighted how, uh, in fact, you can uh, spot 
uh, one third of uh, the entirety of the workforce uh, in the uh, garment industry in North India, part of this uh, yearly circulatory movement. The second type of uh, uh, labor circulation you have massively at work in supply chains like garment and textile is what I would call industrial circulation, which is uh, a type of mobility that doesn't necessarily intercur between the urban and the rural, but is definitely at work uh, across uh, units, which means that you might not go back home, but actually you continue to circulate within an industrial area. As a matter of fact, uh, it, within the same survey I referred to, it was clear that this uh, second type uh, is even more relevant uh, for uh, northern India than uh, uh, the first. And again, there is a lot of crossover one can imagine uh, with uh, not so much with China, I would say, but with other very fragmented and flexible labor regimes, Vietnam, for instance, as highlighted by Cherimele and others, um, that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, we found that two thirds of uh, the actual workforce was engaged in this type of uh, industrial circulation and it was in force in the same factory for less than a year, right? So then, of course, a lot of emphasis is placed on these two, either in labor studies or in labor process studies, uh, and rightly so. But then, the third that has actually take, uh, uh, always gained very little attention, and there is uh, what you can call the march out, right, of uh, these uh, supply chain jobs from in factories, uh, because, uh, and there's a consistency across all studies uh, that clearly indicates that workers leave uh, these uh, types of jobs by the time they're 30, 35. Now, you can find NGO reports from War on Want focusing on Cambodia. Uh, you can find uh, our own work on the Indian garment industry uh, a few years back, but also novel work by Mani et al. Uh, again, on, on, on India, you can find uh, a work uh, done uh, by several people uh, uh, in on Bangladesh. as great work on Bangladesh by Hassan Hashraf, uh, by uh, Becky Prentice. Uh, there is is a, a stern report which is great uh, by New York states on the Bangladeshi garment industry and they seem to be sort of uh, very clear patterns for workers leaving by the time they're 35. So the circulation out of the garment factory is really what we are in the business of here and uh, in a sense in India itself uh, these three levels of circulation uh, vary tremendously with the diversity of uh, the labor regimes uh, that uh, we um, have uh, in the uh, uh, industry uh, um, itself. Now, um, I would not have time, of course, to go into that. This was uh, the focus of uh, my previous work uh, on the sweatshop regime. Uh, but basically, circulations uh, sort of uh, 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 adapt massively and speak of the type of uh, labor relations that are dominant regionally, the type of product specialization you have, and so on and so forth. And in the North, uh, where we are actually looking at, uh, they're quite conspicuous in a sense, they're very difficult to trace, as we'll see in a moment, due to the fact that when we talk about mobility, uh, uh, and circulation, we're talking about uh, quite considerable uh, distances uh, covered. So migrants actually travel uh, uh, towards uh, uh, industrial areas and back uh, covering considerable distance, uh, as opposed to the south when you find instead more type of commuting uh, uh, solutions, although a lot is changing there as well, I would, I would argue. Now, so um, circulation three, while it's uh, overlooked, is uh, uh, crucial. And it's crucial, in fact, to debunk narratives uh, of uh, uh, industrial modernization, which are linear. And this narrative, in fact, assume its character rather than investigating its character. So they engage in this sort of uh, static comparisons between employment experiences. The basic idea from uh, the economic models we know uh, is that uh, people are absorbed into industrial sector jobs generally located in urban areas uh, and that is the main direction of the labor transition. Also labor studies, uh, uh, mainstream labor studies make an assumption which is modernizing, which is uh, the representation 
of the factory as a point of arrival and as a provider of better jobs vis-a-vis uh, -vis instead uh, uh, informal uh, types uh, of work uh, which are considered to be well less modern less beneficial uh, to the poor and so on and so forth so labor informalization and hypermobility disrupt actually this story well, we know that the disruption is already uh, sort of uh, 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 thanks to a huge number of studies that pointed at the poor working conditions of uh, workforces uh, in uh, different types of global factories. But I think here the business we're in is different in a sense that um, the, our aim is not just to demonstrate or to shed light to the fact that the working conditions are poor, but that there is a sliding door between uh, the formal and the informal. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, question of what workers do after is not just a question of them leaving a job which has undesirable employment practices, uh, but it's an analytical question that allows us to say something meaningful about uh, transitions, about so theorizing the direction of travel when we, it comes to uh, global development overall. Now, um, I'm not sure if there was a, a, a method in the madness uh, to quote from, uh, uh, well, from Hamlet, of course, first, but then from Barbara Rice White researching informal labor markets. But in sh surely for us, there was a lot of madness in the method because it was a study that uh, uh, where we were faced with a lot of difficulties uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, trying to collate our sample of reference. Um, this life cycle approach to labor transition we wanted to uh, capture meant identifying workers that no longer work in the type of factories uh, that uh, we uh, started from and also means uh, that uh, the factory itself could not really work uh, as an identifier for the uh, uh, sort of uh, identification of our sample. Now, uh, so we started from reproductive spaces. We started from da daily reproductive spaces, of course, in the full knowledge that the workers we were after would not be leaving there anymore. But because of industrial circulation makes it impossible to actually identify uh, sort of uh, workers via networks within each unit, because you have two thirds of the labor force that changes daily, uh, sorry, yearly. So it would be very difficult to capture some workers that could have information about uh, those that left the industry. We instead focus on uh, what are in India, the informal dormitories uh, where uh, workers uh, actually accommodate themselves when they are in the urban space. Now, the picture that you see underneath, uh, we took uh, in, uh, uh, it's an aerial view of, of Capacera, uh, which is an industrial hamlet uh, um, that is close to uh, Gurugram, one of the uh, uh, key uh, sort of uh, uh, industrial locations uh, in the national capital region. And starting from there, we started the process of reconstructive, uh, reconstructing networks uh, that could tell us, uh, uh, could help us to identify the interviewees. Um, so perhaps <laughs> this is like a full paper should, dedica should be dedicated to that actually. Uh, so uh, through uh, connections with the uh, labor contractors, uh, informal hamlet contractors, uh, uh, current workers that still work in the NCR, we were, and of course, union help massively. Um, we put together an informal directory uh, and uh, then uh, uh, um, the uh, enumerators, uh, the very many enumerators that were part of the study is actually uh, sort of calling up, they identified 50 respondents. So that is uh, the process that led us uh, to um, the, well, I would not really want to call it a survey, 50 is a very small number, but then it was uh, a mix between quant and qualitative information that was put together to reconstruct these uh, laboring corridors, uh, if you want, that connect uh, spaces which are over a thousand kilometers apart and characterized by very different types of employment patterns. Uh, we zoomed in further through 17 live interviews out of these 50. 
And that is part and parcel of the type of life cycle approach we try to uh, 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 sort of propose for the study of the employment experiences. Uh, and COVID-19, of course, uh, was a massive disruption. So in the end, there was an, a number of, of uh, issues. Uh, um, well, there were a number of practices uh, uh, that we had to put in place, uh, including eventually shifting for the last uh, 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 histories to phone interviews to complete the study, which, I mean, whose fieldwork was done uh, mostly across 2021, um, as a matter of fact. Um, so to give you a sense of the distance traveled, this is uh, Kapashir on, on, well, on, on the left, you have a very sort of sketched uh, a crude map of India. Uh, you see uh, where Delhi is located and the state of Bihar is the one after Uttar Pradesh. Uh, it's a violet state uh, second uh, right from Delhi. And these are the uh, different um, uh, uh, districts you find and our work focus on three thanks to this process of snowballing that I talked about uh, in Patna, Nalanda uh, and uh, Muzaffarpur. Um, the majority of our respondents, I will not talk much on the sample, we can just go through that in the Q&A for those that are more interested in the political economy of, of India. Um, but the majority, well, there were majority male migrants, apart, except from uh, two, and the um, uh, representation in caste terms uh, 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 is for other backward caste and general caste, so the general caste in India, with a, a significant share of uh, extremely backward caste, which is a characteristic classification of the government of uh, Bihar. They were all, of course, above 50, uh, 35, except two cases, and a significant share of illiteracy and sample bias uh, 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 was there because uh, we, mm, in the end, managed to oversample uh, sort of uh, at the bottom of the other. So there were a few tailors, but the majority would be like checkers or other types of workers. So um, I will give you very sort of uh, brief uh, note on uh, um, what workers say in relation to the uh, initial shaping of this circulation number three. So uh, um, the uh, years that work and the reason for leaving, all of them, well, not all of them, sorry, the majority of them, 80% were recruited by contractors to go to the NCR and uh, they actually uh, uh, sort of 20% uh, uh, reported being instead directly recruited, um, which in itself is a very interesting uh, um, finding considering that uh, uh, factories in Delhi are just supposedly uh, moving towards more direct form of recruitment, but actually this is not what the workers uh, say about what happened to them. And in fact, with the loosening of the Contract Labor Act, I think there's going to be always a massive gap between what reported by companies and what reported by workers. Now, the number of years they work in the factory was varied, uh, and but let's say that the majority of them uh, worked for either five years or slightly less, uh, and uh, between five and ten years uh, uh, before going back home, which is very much in line with what the industry standards are. It goes between five years, say, to maximum of 15. These are extremely depleting industries. And uh, so effectively, the question of workers, what workers do after, is crucial because they only do this for an extremely short period of, it, of their life. So what, the, what happened after should be of our concern if we want to say anything meaningful about uh, 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 economic livelihoods. Now, the monthly income in the garment industry that was reported is between mostly between five and ten thousand, which again is very much in line both with the minimum wages. Uh, they're around seven to nine, depending on uh, which type of uh, category of, of work, uh, you know, of experience you're in. Um, although there has been a reviewing of minimum wages uh, 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 with now the implementation of the new labor codes. Um, and uh, in terms of the reason for leaving the industry, the majority reported uh, uh, 
having to do with uh, the low earnings that ultimately they face, but also to the uh, uh, sort of uh, better opportunities that many felt uh, um, uh, were uh, at home. And factory closures are also well represented in uh, the um, uh, sort of uh, 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 among the reasons for leaving. And in fact, uh, I'm in the part of another project at the moment. There is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, tracing uh, the main reasons behind uh, workers uh, taking employers to court by union uh, in the industry and illegal terminations and factory closures, in fact, uh, uh, over are overrepresented um, in this regard. Now, what workers do after is all sorts. So we found uh, 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 quite a few workers engage in domestic work. This is in fact both household activities as well as paid wor domestic work for either privates or offices and so on and so forth. Uh, and with the exception of the uh, care uh, uh, offered by the two women in the sample, we have uh, the majority either engaging in some form of uh, uh, informal shop uh, seller work, uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, um, became barbers uh, and that was part of the family occupation and so on and so forth. I'll not go through that. Some are self-employed in non-agricultural activity or casual labor, but the, the main point being that they go back to doing a vast array of informal occupation that characterize uh, uh, um, the rural space. Now, uh, uh, we will see with the narrative uh, 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 what we can say more about uh, this uh, 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 um, livelihood that you know they find themselves in but before we do that I would say that uh, is worth uh, uh, sort of uh, um, reckoning a little bit more with the economics aspect of the transition in relation to comparison uh, between wages uh, that, al uh, uh, that allows us uh, to sort of uh, assess uh, or compare uh, different types of uh, uh, earnings, uh, but also different types of possibilities that uh, 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 factory work offer as opposed to uh, instead uh, uh, informal work at home of different types. And uh, interestingly, 50% reported earning less um, than in the NCR. So, you know, there is a premium attached to factory work, but actually when you look at the variance uh, of the income reported in the working paper, we have the full uh, uh, table with uh, uh, the uh, income, uh, oh, sorry, the wages reported by, by the workers. Uh, we'll see that the fall in income is actually quite uh, uh, undramatic. So that 68%, in fact, only earn 500 to 1,500 less. And of course, uh, the women bias a little bit, a very small sample, because that would just instead move to uh, unpaid factory care, uh, sorry, family care. Now, for one third of workers, the fall was most significant, uh, um, with 24% earning between two and 4,000 uh, uh, less. So, I mean, that's more uh, uh, con uh, considerable, I would say. Um, uh, but even when the wages uh, are, are, were higher, workers, interestingly enough, reported that they could not remit during the period where they were uh, in force in the garment industry, despite the fact that the reason we will see for moving to the NCR uh, had a great focus on remittances in the first place. None of them, in fact, reported to be able to save during the period uh, in force uh, in the garment factory. Um, and this is an outlier with the, uh, the very few studies, I would say, that were done on this particular issue, so what workers do after. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, the very interesting work by Sandhya Vamanne uh, on Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka garment workers, where she highlights instead that women in that case uh, were able to save and actually sort of uh, invest their savings uh, um, in uh, some sort of uh, uh, informal enterprise venture, which in a sense, we still not confirm the modernizing stories or the loose model in any sort of meaningful way, but at least it would just propose another 
bridge onto uh, uh, modernization, uh, uh, if you want. But that's not the case for us at all, because we didn't get any savings whatsoever, which again is in, in, in line with the, what others have studies in relation to the type of uh, uh, livelihoods and earnings that garment factories allow at presence. And one of standout study for me is, uh, for instance, uh, the um, uh, one done by Jean Jenkins uh, and uh, uh, Paul Blythe with reference to the accumulation of debt actually uh, uh, in factories, uh, in, uh, 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 in garment factories in Bangalore. Now, um, back home, a lot of workers reported they just felt uh, 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 better primarily for access to the land, which is uh, a key issue. And I'll say a few words on that. And I hope uh, then Costa will help uh, me well, on many things, but particularly on these issues uh, during the Q&A. But what we found is that land ownership was widespread, and these are micro holding. Let's be clear. I mean, this is would not even be classified as small uh, uh, as, as uh, marginal farmers. They're micro marginal far farmers, because in fact they could not be classified as farmers. Still, land ownership was uh, very well represented in the sample. 76% owned land. And I think this is crucial, not so much in terms of alternative livelihoods. It was very clear that they relied on the labor market to survive, but in terms of uh, having a reproductive subsidy of sort that was uh, 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 sort of uh, either be used as collateral or like uh, a safety net for the family. And it was central to uh, collective livelihoods of the family itself. So despite uh, land was totally marginal, we're talking about a few katas uh, here, um, that would be 0 0.013 uh, hectares, like uh, um, in some cases, uh, but um, it's still very much central to uh, the uh, subsidizing uh, the wage and um, you know, uh, this type of partial dispossession is something that uh, 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 many other studies have captured. Uh, and of course, you know, there is a lot of spin offs in terms of debate on what it means for working classes today. What what I'm interested here is uh, what it means for the fact that the, these workers uh, can circulate back home. So engage in the type of transition we want to map now. Um, so circulation, uh, 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 land in fact allows the circulation uh, uh, um, uh, back home. It just provides these sliding doors between the urban and the rural, and uh, uh, it uh, represents a reproductive lifeline, um, uh, and it's a pivot uh, uh, around which uh, the social reproduction of the household is uh, organized. Now, in uh, other work, I highlighted how this has to be seen as a subsidy to capital, because in fact, the armed employers have always been able to send workers back home to their land, in fact, and to their families uh, in lean periods and periods uh, that uh, uh, they were not great for the so, in a sense, uh, this allowed the externalization of labor costs uh, 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 during the entire periods. So, it was a, a, an actual sort of uh, uh, subsidy to value. But from the point of view of the workers themselves, this is a, a subsidy to uh, livelihood. It was not linked to caste, which we found interesting. So, there wasn't really a link between uh, 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 land possession and um, uh, uh, sort of exclusion, say, for instance, uh, of uh, extremely backward caste, but there was a link uh, uh, instead between caste and other forms of social contributions, which we also um, about. There would be another type of uh, uh, lifeline that uh, workers would have. Uh, so, in terms of uh, social insurance, 60% of them had no social insurance whatsoever, but those that did either have uh, below poverty line cards or above poverty line cards. Uh, this was uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, somewhat related to, to, to caste with an overrepresentation of uh, extremely backward caste with access to BPL cards in particular. Um, now, social insurance uh, also mediated the labor transition actually so the net effect of the reverse migration for workers has to take into consideration both land as well as uh, um, uh, this, the access to this contribution. So in a sense, that very small 
uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 differential in wages that we have seen as respondent, respondent reported has to also uh, uh, be adjusted uh, to this, which we didn't do. But I mean, uh, analytically, this is the argument I would say that I would put forward. And there are different ways to see it, again, uh, either as inclusive policy vis-a-vis -vis low cost or, you know, as uh, some uh, our author have also actually claimed as processes that are retarding primitive accumulation, including the type of disruptions that you would have with that, this type of uh, 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 massive uh, immiseration. Otherwise, I'm referring here to the work of uh, uh, um, Kalyan Sanyal. Now, uh, this being a very crude snapshot of some of the highlights we found, I really suggest you, you read the working paper for more. Um, then we zoomed in uh, with life history um, and uh, uh, what was particularly interesting uh, were, you know, work, workers' own uh, uh, representation of the reason behind the transition to DNCR and the transition back and the differences between industrial work uh, and the current experience instead in the village and entanglement of land and informal work that emerge from their stories. So very quickly, um, I think uh, I have around five minutes left, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so very quickly, um, yes, the, um, yeah, it, it, for once I'm being sort of uh, self-disciplined. Um, so the first is that the decision to migrate uh, was very clearly a collective decision when you read workers' narratives. So it never occurs uh, that this is a representation of an individual act, while instead the literature on migration itself uh, overstress the relevance of the individual, including some heterodox accounts of migration, I would say, despite, of course, they confute the cl classic story. But I mean, these are like very collective decisions, particularly with households owning something back home. And the strategy is circle around remittances. And the expectation of remittances is systematically disattended. And you could see this emerging very clearly in terms of uh, really painful recall by our interviewees of when you realize, uh, you know, getting your wage and realizing how much you need to pay. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just for the room in the hamlet we just seen, but the fact that you had mediated consumption through the Lord's of the hamlets, as you know, many others have written about uh, Tom Cowan, among others, uh, 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 etc. Um, so you don't manage to really save. And uh, that also explains uh, the disillusionment and the going back, uh, as well as the factory closure. So the, the decision to leave, uh, uh, it's not necessarily due only to retrenchment, which instead might be the slight bias that more radical labor studies would have. I mean, who want to work like, to, to live like that, you know? So this is something that the workers repeated in, in their interviews. Um, also, it's the fact that migration is performed in groups from villages is something that, uh, you know, I, I always had it clear, even in like in relation to previous work on different parts of this workshop regime. Now, the difference between industrial work uh, and uh, the current experience uh, was represented in terms of escape from harassment. So the, uh, uh, a lot of uh, workers insisted on the politics of the labor contracting, the fact that they were exposed to multiple uh, types of harassment and, and violence, not just in the factory, but primarily, in fact, in the reproductive uh, 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 sphere. And, uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, they couldn't have guessed, not, not just uh, the Hamlet not adjusting uh, to family life, uh, which he doesn't at all. It's uh, only just atomized uh, 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 laborers uh, uh, connected connected uh, to uh, uh, the nearby factories, uh, but also uh, whenever they had guests, uh, they were charged. Uh, uh, there was a very strict surveillance uh, of the dormitories, uh, quite interestingly in ways that recall some of the um, sort of uh, narratives uh, collected by Punnai, uh, Jenny Chan and others uh, when it comes to China, despite this not looking like uh, a dormitory in a Chinese sense, but even like this informal hamlet can have very strict level of surveillance uh, 
uh, indeed. And also uh, uh, narratives of freedom, Azadi was like uh, sort of uh, recalled by workers quite a bit, which I thought was interesting because in a sense, you have uh, a lot of uh, focus on patterns of unfreedom in rural areas in India, uh, yet I think uh, there is also now a sort of a very convincing literature on the places on free labor uh, uh, in force in uh, factory work as well. And uh, uh, at least back home, the economies of care, you know, that many have talked about uh, 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 more recently, Alpa uh, and Jenslerk uh, could mean for workers that they uh, more freely, at least um, their, uh, um, in a more uh, uh, human way. Now, also crucially, we were expecting, I think maybe that is uh, my bias being disattended, but uh, we didn't really uh, uh, find either through the data we have, but also through the interviews, uh, the fact that uh, land represents an alternative livelihood at all to informal work. If something it just enmeshes and uh, interplay with informal work in different ways, uh, uh, different trajectories of transition of, in, you know, sort of individual transition. Uh, and uh, um, informal work that they got in all the occupation I just briefly sketched uh, was mostly based on what workers used to do before, which uh, it's uh, an irony, right? Because uh, it really means there's a very so little that the industrial work changes for them in terms of uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities for the after, um, or they just uh, manage to find new jobs in in uh, uh, new uh, sort of uh, newly forged uh, um, kinship uh, networks. Uh, but we had quite a few from the barber cast, of course, from the Nike cast that ended up in returning being part of the family business. And so there is this revolving door, in a sense, between informal and industrial work. Now, conclusion and implications uh, of uh, the study, of course, for the, uh, the disruption of uh, 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 modernizing narratives, I think uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. Um, this narrative really do not speak to our global present um, and how industrial work is shaped today, right? So the confusion that dominates uh, in the in our industrial modernity, which we are already living, we are coeval, and uh, this is what industrial modernity looks like. Um, there is really not one way transition, and I think much more work has to be done on this uh, type of transitions where workers transit back from factory to informal work occupations because is at work and is just well documented, uh, uh, sorry, well well explained by differential in wages, uh, which really suggests, um, 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 really suggests in a sense uh, that uh, uh, factory work uh, and informal work uh, should not really be assessed one against the other, but more understood as different forms of work in poverty, in, especially when factory work is in given sectors. Methodologically, I think uh, the takeaway, I hope, is uh, the uh, need for us to overcome static analysis, uh, 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 comparing employment experiences in snapshots, because we really don't get anything. And this is actually not how people experience labor and laboring anyway. But instead, applying a life cycle based approach, to, uh, uh, it's much uh, sort of more useful to actually understand the working life of people as the canvas against which we need to assess different moments uh, and uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in the labor market. Now, very recently, there was an excellent paper by Shirin Rai, uh, uh, Brown, and, and, and Ruvampura. Uh, there was criticizing the uh, sustainable development goals uh, uh, in relation to the decent work agenda. So particularly as the G8, but I mean, sort of they did a great job in actually sort of uh, providing a snapshot overview of all others to argue that the agenda actually consider at all uh, social reproduction, particularly in the form of unpaid, uh, of course, gendered uh, labor contributions. Now, in a sense, I see these contribution hours as scaling up to say, well, assessment of decent work uh, must uh, uh, happen against the far structure in which employment is uh, experienced. So to accounting for paid labor, but also considering social reproduction uh, uh, 
shaping the life of the worker in question as the canvas against which we need to assess experiences. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ale. Very, very provocative message, actually. Very rich um, research. So congratulations to both of you and good stuff. I hope uh, there have some, been some intermittencies with the connection, I guess, just at the last, at the end of the presentation. So uh, I hope the Q&A will also be an opportunity for us to clarify uh, whether some messages have not been clear for the audience. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, I have some questions, but I think I have to open the floor for uh, Q&A and uh, um, people can start um, raise their hands. Uh, so we'll have the opportunity. Um, they'll have the opportunity to ask questions. I don't know if ID has let them because I think it's uh, been disabled. Yeah, but you have Tio. Hi, Tio. You Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, very well. If you could please introduce <laughs> yourself so that is like, yeah, we start with the questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, for the guest speakers, well, not for us, I guess, for the internal, <laughs> we know we want. Okay, yes, okay, so <laughs> I'm Theo Papiano, I'm Professor of Politics, Innovation and Development at the OU, okay. So um, I put the camera off uh, because of connection issues. Um, so I have one question. I mean, I, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, very interesting based on, on that case. So if, if I understood well, um, the argument is that, of course, we have an exodus from factory to non-factory work. And you argue that, in fact, this is a move, this is a transition from um, industrial work towards informal work. So you make this distinction between industrial work that you consider to be formal, if I understand it well, to the informal work, which is basically work in, in the rural areas. But I guess this is the case for um, some urban spaces, because um, not all factories in the area of Delhi, of course, um, have formalized work. I mean, there are so many thousands of um, factories, small scale industries in the area of Delhi that they do informal work. And these people tend to move, I guess, now from informal work to informal work. So it's not necessarily perhaps the transition from industrial formal work to informal work, but some people um, used to work in factories in a very, very informal setting. I mean, there are small factories in Delhi doing chemicals, doing many different things, and the working conditions are very, very informal. Is that not the case? Okay. Thank you, Dio. And so, I think that yeah. Yeah, should we collect a couple of questions and uh, yeah. and then we'll have, uh, uh, you know, like you for you to um, discuss. I'm I'm not sure if Heidi has uh, um, give people authorization to um, raise their hands because I get it. Yeah, now yes. So if anyone wants to ask, in the meantime, maybe I will ask my question. Uh, yeah, Kevin. Hi, Kevin, Dean from Economics. Raise your hand. Hi, Alessandra. Kalstov, okay. uh, nice to meet you. I'm Kevin Dean. Uh, I'm in economics here as well, uh, former SOAS economics um, PhD. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I'm going to only ask two for now because it's a super interesting presentation. It does raise lots of questions, both very conception theoretical and very practical. So I just wanted to ask, a couple of questions around what you think kind of I think looking at this transit transition <clears throat> back to um, rural areas helps us rethink why people move in the first place. So what what is self-sustaining about this process? Because I imagine, you know, young men are seeing on a regular basis slightly older men returning with not better off, not having saved any money, 
reporting all these these kinds of negative experiences of that process. So I wonder what self sustains that process and whether periods of time spent away are reducing over time as as more recent, you know, um, young people move and quickly realize that the things that they've heard from people who've returned are, are, are accurate and, and perhaps get disillusioned with with th those conditions more quickly than maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. So I, I wonder over time what's happening to this this process and how it self sustain it sustains itself. I'm also wondering whether your participants did anything positive about being away and working in these factories. Is there any any tiny thing that that they say that keeps them there? Is it you know the social side of things? Is it? I don't, I'm just trying to imagine um, you know what what the positive aspects were because if there really are no benefits from it, I, again I do question why this form of uh, mobility is sort of perpetuates itself. So just yeah, be really interested to hear more. Alessandro, do you want to answer like do, and Gustavo, would you answer these couple of questions or should we uh, wait get one more? Is what do you think? As you wish, Lori, but we can uh, both answer these questions perhaps yeah, very quickly. Okay, let's go ahead, yes, with these two. I mean, I think a big okay. <laughs> the, first, uh, the first question, um, the first question, well, comment more than question. Um, I wasn't actually suggesting that this is formal work in factories. In fact, I think I dedicated <laughs> a huge part of my uh, career to actually argue that this is uh, entirely informalized. Although I would say that it makes still sense to distinguish between informal work occupations uh, from informalized work in otherwise formal realms. I mean, certainly the government of India does it, the ILO does it, and I think there is uh, a reason for that. Um, you know, if you want to crudely put it, it might correspond somehow uh, in economics, although very imperfectly, I would say, to uh, arguments that counterpose uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, labor or like employment uh, uh, in more sort of uh, standardized ways to self-employment. Uh, I think there's a lot to say about the uh, problematic uh, uh, nature of this differentiation, but in a sense, it also doesn't really help necessarily to flatten their difference entirely. So while, of course, all the factory work, not just some, all the factory work uh, in garment is informalized, even in large factories. If you look at the people working without contracts, not accessing social contributions and so on and so forth, and mostly being contract workers, uh, I would say that the uh, informal livelihoods they do back home uh, is uh, quite different in the, in the way in which uh, sort of it presents uh, or like is assumed to present different challenges and is assumed to present uh, different uh, uh, features. So I think the message is uh, these are two moments, uh, uh, very informalized nature, both of them, they're different. The assumption still is that factory work is better, pays more. It just does something to uh, uh, workers that join in. This is actually not the case in this sector, at least based on our informants. This is actually the second study I do, in fact, on returning migrants. The first one was in Bangalore with women workers. So we just really find no evidence for that, at least for India. But, um, sort of the, the second question, uh, Kevin's question, which is a very good one. I think the capturing of uh, sort of uh, different uh, notes in, in the core of what people share had a lot to do with this being returnee migrants. Uh, so for instance, when I do life histories of workers uh, in factories, I do capture a lot of that. And there are others that capture a lot of that, all these sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, expectations with one they join, uh, well, for women in the South is a massive liberating experience from asphyxiating family control, for instance, that no wage can account for, uh, but also for like uh, groups of young uh, workers moving in blocks 
many for the first time in their life uh, to Delhi, uh, uh, there is uh, all sorts of possibilities opening up. In fact, there is a fantastic um, novel, no? the uh, Rointon Mysteries novel based on uh, that they really well represent the expectations of these two uh, people that moved to to um, well, an unknown Indian city from from rural area, but still, like we're capturing people back. So uh, this is how I explained the uh, narratives. Uh, we found very few people that say, "Oh my God, I miss it so much." We found virtually none within our group. That doesn't mean that they're not there, but we just uh, uh, didn't find that. What it means structurally. It's always uh, tricky to sort of universalize from such a small sample, but in a sense, it's just that I think first in India, you have very loose labor markets, right? So in a sense, you have uh, the Hindi belt that is a massive reservoirs of uh, what is it, a million workers overall. So it's just, uh, uh, OK, that might be word of mouth in terms of uh, the elderly coming back. Well, the elderly, the middle ages, uh, aged uh, workers coming back. But in a sense, I think it doesn't uh, 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 sort of uh, exhaust the desire to escape the village economy. Um, and the fact that it's self-perpetuating is because you have the labor in the supply chain structure the way it is. So I think there's multiple factors at work. Uh, um, but in terms of what comes out from the workers' voices, I think it's because we are just looking at something ending that this is what we captured. I don't know if Costa, Costa has a, a different take on that. No, I don't have a different take, Ali. Thanks. Uh, but I was just going to say the uh, Louisian narrative, in fact, is is something that kind of gets disrupted with the kind of uh, approach we've taken. Because even in the structural, I mean, just to answer Theo and Kevin's uh, point together in a certain sense, you know, in fact, actually, the uh, macro statistics shows that just before COVID, I mean, that's what possibly caught our eye as well. It's almost 12 to 13 million people who made this transition back. So even the macro narrative actually has holes in it. Uh, the other part of the narrative was formal employment, uh, which is perpetuated by contractors. And that's how most of the workers go. So to kind of answer Kevin's point, uh, it's uh, so like Ali said, the ones uh, we were looking at are the ones who've come back. But of course, the contractors and the ones who haven't also have so there's a push and pull in the narrative in a certain sense uh, at the village that it's uh, the village the urban uh, factory work is still attractive and there's one set who's come back and who says it's not attractive so i think uh, that that narrative actually helps in a certain sense to keep the supply chain on in a certain way Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was being mute. Um, we move on to the next round of questions, um, which I think starts with mine because I don't see any raised hands raising. But yeah, uh, so this is a very rich, um, uh, yeah, findings and uh, I mean research, and I think it's uh, it's uh, very well situates, you know, these like challenges of uh, yeah modernization and uh, rural urban transition, which obviously is like in some cases it it it, it is a stretch uh, i was wondering and i know that this is a very dynamic figure and then this is a very like you know empirical um and dynamic uh, phenomenon but um do you have any idea of the proportion of those who return and i'm sorry if i missed this information and those who stay within the industrial like circuits um or, I mean, at least the question is, is there somebody, like in proportion, there is somebody that stays, like, have you encountered anyone like that decided like to, to, to remain into the industrial work uh, employment? And um, my second question relates to um, this issue of the land as a subsidies, because I found it a very interesting concept. Uh, I work on Uzbekistan and um, Uzbekistan has a, a binary system of land uh, management which is evolving they've been like through the you know since independence they had maybe 20 land reforms i mean i'm sure like uh, i don't want to get into the land reforms literally because 
will open a Pandora box, but uh, my point is that, I mean, if I, and I'm being very, I mean, provocative and blunt here, but I mean, we live in London, okay, where basically capitalism is forcing urban uh, middle class or like pre precariat to like, uh, you know, cope with the these inequalities and contradiction of capitalism by acquiring these urban spaces and urban horticultural spaces. Uh, and they are at the same purpose. So being subsidizing, you know, the social reproduction of livelihood, like of normal, like high income country citizens. Why that would be like something to challenge in that sense because I can see why you are using it because obviously like the the work the industrial workers doesn't get enough from the industrial work at the same time living in the rural areas no it's uh, it's it's still a not desirable end point but so I mean like I think it's like you're 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 mm, depicting a picture that is pretty much you know, like the outcome of these two imperfect situations. So, and in in that sense, in some countries, having like a direct access to land for food, immediate production, not to make it out of a, like make it a business or, uh, you know, to give it to their brother and sisters when they're gone. It's a very interesting like uh, safety net. Uh, that is also being paradoxically replicated in in high income countries. Uh, so why? I mean, um, what would you like? Yeah, if you can expand a bit on what you said about that. Um, and I have another question, but I think it. Ah, oh, yeah, it's about the the normative assumption that you know makes the modernizers um, believe that industrial work is still better. And I think it's related to fiscal policy and to the idea that uh, it will be, uh, it will enable uh, um, like smooth condition to then, you know, make these worker taxpayers and benefiting of social provisions of state, so public social provisions. So I don't know if, uh, you know, it's like, in this, I know that this is not the scope of your paper, but I was wondering, I mean, it's really like in this sense, it's very real about the fact that this is like something that it cannot be captured easily in a country with very, for instance, um, low administrative capacity. And here I'm not playing the neocolon because I come from Italy, which is like pretty much the same, but it's like, I mean, what is the what? What would you reply if someone tells you? But yeah, this has been. I mean, the, in the modernizers always think that I mean the industrial space is the most direct and most like um, useful, um, you know, channel of enabling this fiscal revenue for like from a you know kind of a role of the state, developmental state perspective. So I was wondering whether how do I mean you guys? What do you think about this? And I stop here and I don't know if someone wants to ask a question. We have some more more time. Uh, I guess they've been like intimidated. <laughs> but yeah, let's go with this for now. And then, yeah. Um, I don't remember the first question anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's um. So the first question was about, I mean, so the second question was about the land. The third land question was about the revenue and the third question about the, um, uh, the, if someone remains, like who remains, like if there is someone, like if you can give an aggregate and no. like. <laughs> okay, yeah. so of course someone remains, even like uh, the first labor contractor we stumbled across in Cabachera that Costa will remember very well. That was a former workers that managed to remain as uh, a contractor. In fact, there is some literature that actually depicts how labor contracting at the lower echelon is, which is a very a fairly risky business and a very sort of uh, 
exposed to risk business might be taken on by these workers. So I cannot, of course, make the argument that everybody goes back, but I would make the argument that a significant part will go back, if not to their village, to rural areas. They cannot afford the livelihood in, in the city. So either they move to other types of occupation. We did uh, spot one that was not among the elders that, in fact, uh, he eventually went back home for a little bit. But then we found them driving an auto rickshaw in Uttarakhand. <laughs> OK, so there are like, again, these this corridors or like this, this it's it's the the craziness of living of like uh, going places where you have no social security uh, uh, and you need to survive but uh, very few i would say will manage to settle down in uh, industrial areas uh, as it was before because the costs are very high which also explains why there has been gradually a disappearance uh, of uh, um uh, of of uh, self-employment or like family businesses, small family businesses connected to the garment business in Delhi, because you need to have a house big enough for you to set up uh, a mini sort of uh, industrial concern. And either you are uh, the old generations now, land is actually really sought after. They're in the process or even like uh, selling agricultural land around Delhi. There are people that wrote brilliantly about the predatory nature of these sales and so on and so forth. So I cannot really give you an aggregate, okay? So also because unlike China, there has the township, the housing registration system whereby you can have the flows. This is why it's the only country where this is this job is done because you know how many people you have in, you know how many people you have out. It works as a sort of uh, very visible door that records. This is not the case for India. But I would say that significant part and 80% of them will be either contract workers or seasonal or casualized workers uh, with the entire within the entire uh, sort of uh, global factory systems uh, in Delhi and, you know, in other parts. Well, I don't want to universalize, but in other parts also is considerable. This, the third question, I will leave the land entirely to Gustav, who can also comment on, on this, um, on, on uh, outliers. Um, the uh, third question, uh, well, if you look at uh, also in this sense, no, uh, the possibilities to uh, uh, capture revenues for now, what we know about uh, the failure of the system is like the probably billion rupees that lie in unclaimed uh, provident fund contributions uh, because of the lack of portability of social contribution, which the new labor codes in India should address, but they haven't, uh, you know, we don't know yet if they will manage because uh, technically, yes, but for now, even for the very few workers. Uh, that despite status uh, we see social contributions paid they are really not able to access pf now there is a rollover of these uh, universal uh, uh, card numbers whereby you, you should be able to have that the narratives of our, our workers which left a while back actually capture pf fraud so the very few that try to get provident fund they didn't manage they call it very openly wage theft in fact, so even in that sense, well, if you focus on the fiscal revenues from the factories, yeah, of course you're right. But if you focus on possibility of taxing the Ahmadmi, the, the general man worker, no, because, uh, you know, they're just footloose labor. And in fact, their own contributions lie there on news. Gustav, what, I yeah. Gustav wants to answer the, the land, land question. Sorry the for land. part. I no, no, out. absolutely no. I also also I'm, because I can see now that there is a agrologist and a land uh, uh, affectionate, but he's not raising questions. So I'll, I'll try to, you know. No, no. I, I mean, I think uh, uh, with the. Uh, I mean, I, I speak of this from an agrarianist position. Uh, about land. I think uh, the primitive accumulation logic requires the first part that, uh, that you know, uh, to dispossess 
uh, you go off the land, uh, that narrative, the illusion narrative actually comes into play very well at that point of time. So like uh, the de deagrenized part of why a migrant worker wants to move at a young age, I think fits that narrative. But also uh, the transition question, I think, uh, is, uh, and that's why the reverse part I find quite interesting, uh, is because uh, it's only for a particular period of time that you're selling your labor part, are you in the industrial slash urban whatever kind of a situation. And then uh, the land becomes a kind of a subsidy fallback position and which we actually saw very starkly, unfortunately, during the COVID break. Uh, but this, this kind of movement, uh, unfortunately, at a macro level was also happening in India over quite some uh, periods of time before COVID hit. So, I mean, uh, like, of course, like Alessandro said, in India, we have stock figures, but even the stock figures were quite interesting. Like, as I uh, mentioned, the share of employment in agriculture actually went up from 42% to 45%. That's a whopping 13 million people. Uh, and where did they come from? Because that's, that's what actually got us thinking even more, uh, that episodically, uh, people and their uh, share in land and livelihood back in the village uh, actually goes up uh, and which is something we necessarily don't uh, look at once we're looking at the industrial urban narrative. So I think it's, it's a different way of looking at transitions, uh, you know, halted, disrupted transitions. But uh, I, I think... Uh, we don't have, I mean, even I don't have all the answers for, uh, you know, how many, but I can see over time that this reliance on uh, land and of course, like Alessandra mentioned, the cost part with land, uh, the non-industrial uh, livelihood opportunities uh, in that broader network also means uh, that this transition, this reverse transition back uh, kind of is at play. Uh, the who remains part, Alessandra, like she's mentioned, the first person that we met had become like, a, you know, he, he had managed to stay back uh, and do other things, not, not factory work, uh, but he was essentially looking over, you know, the rent collection of the place, the worker lines and, and the building. And uh, that's something which in that local political economy had given him some muscle and space. So that's the reason I guess he stayed back, but yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Obviously this is all very context specific, but I think you can, no, we can draw lessons from uh, for other case as well. All right, so I can see that there are no more questions. So I would, then uh, let you go as i'm sure you're very busy <laughs> people and uh, thank you very much as uh, we know uh, we you, you already uh, know the uh, recording will be available um, uh, later today or tomorrow uh, so we'll share it with you uh, also on, on social media uh, please get in touch and i don't know if you want to uh, share the uh, link uh, to the paper in the chat box feel free uh, to do so uh, I found one, but you told me that maybe it's not the last one. It needs unedited. So uh, let me know if uh, if it's okay for me to share it. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, but I have another question <laughs> that I haven't seen. Sorry. Um, so just let me read out loud. This is the last question we have. So uh, when you study should the migrants found their native place and domestic work primarily better? Is it because they found it less self-alienating because in native place they were not engaged in producing commodity with exchange value. Secondly, the pandemic job loss during the pandemic and regaining of job in the post-pandemic scenario revealed studies of working in India 2021. That's a significant number of regained job, but didn't got in the same capacity as earlier but join the gig economy instead. So in aggregating this resulting in further industrialization and informalization, so the first is part is about whether the, like the, the, the going back to the rural is less alienating. The second part is whether the COVID, I guess, has reconfigured the demand of labor within new, uh, new capacities. 
so, and if this is led to uh, the industrialization and the informalization, uh, I don't know if Anna Ananyu uh, is here and he wants to. Um, yeah, say something. No, so <laughs> I don't know if you want to. I think he is there. I see him. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So if, yeah. yeah. Hi. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah, actually, just I just uh, tried to ask the question, the second question, because in overall, like if you if you're saying that they are kind of uh, happy to, when like primarily they are happy in their native places, then it must be self less self alienating in much in sense. And at the same time, when uh, like uh, in the post COVID scenario, when like people are reg regaining their job in mostly in informal sector per se in, in the gig economy. So in aggregate, is it like creating a condition which is which will be further producing informal labor uh, like uh, conditions which will be like reproducing it again and again like, uh, like yeah that was the question do you want to thank you ananyo kastav do you yeah, want yeah. to go yeah the second one yes of course uh, for deindustrialization and informalization yes the first one, we don't know if the workers are happy or not. I mean, uh, the alienation part, uh, we uh, didn't get into. Uh, but I think it was uh, the workers' narratives made it very clear <clears throat> that this kind of a, a, a strategy, a livelihood strategy, diversified livelihood strategy, is something that the workers are also, uh, through their life cycles, uh, trying to figure out and uh, get into. Or whether it's a better off situation or not, uh, in terms of happiness, I don't know. But in terms of a political economic understanding, uh, a lot of what the workers said was "izzat ki zindagi" or "azadi" or you know uh, that kind of a situation, uh, which I think is a work-life experience. So I guess uh, you know they kind of went with the idea that it could be better, uh, but it wasn't. It was pathetic conditions uh, and. Hence, I guess uh, uh, the uh, reverse uh, transition happened. Uh, and of course, a lot of it was alienating as well, uh, because uh, I guess, let's say for uh, the Naikas, for the barber uh, that, uh, you know, who, who we spoke to, I guess he wanted to escape the uh, caste system uh, when he was young uh, in the village. And hence, the urban transition to the factory, et cetera. But uh, lack of respect and dignity even there for a diff different kind of a context and reason leads him back. And uh, what what uh, actually keeps him through, and in fact, we had a very interesting uh, interview uh, through the COVID situation is the fact that he could actually fall back, unfortunately, on his caste-linked uh, occupational livelihood situation. There was somebody else who who actually moved out from there uh, and and did pursue that and became a fruit seller, and he had very different uh, experiences. But of course, COVID disrupted that as well. So self-employed uh, uh, also wasn't uh, something which uh, kind of solved the issue. Also, because possibly we were covering COVID times as well. But that was something that was still better off uh, in terms of. Uh, you know, life experiences and chances uh, than being in Copper City. Thanks. I don't know if Ale wants to add Sorry, something. Yeah, just to say that uh, I don't think also the argument we're making is, uh, as I said, we try not to, under while we try to make this uh, history speak, we also don't want to fall in the trap of essentializing them or like uh, sort of. Uh, uh, um, how to put this, or to sort of frame transitions as a decision, okay, as a indiv matter of individual choice. This is not what we're trying to get at. So what we're trying to argue is, in fact, to embed these uh, transitions uh, uh, in the context of the broader livelihood strategies uh, that people embark on and how they speak to wider transformations that people are central uh, to. So um, in, it's not a matter of uh, 
people being happier or people deciding to go back home. First, garment work is so taxing that you will not even be able to do it past 15 years because you will be exhausted, right? So uh, we, I've wrote elsewhere of all the health conditions that you sort of develop and sort of, so it's not like a choice. It's considering the type of uh, uh, political economy of the factory system, as well as that of the broad uh, livelihoods that people engage with, which are highly mobile, that you have this uh, to, to sort of uh, 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 understand this voice into. It's, it's, it's not a matter of, you know, oh, I'm going to decide this over that. Uh, so that's, you know, what I wanted to make clear that sort of the, the spoke more, I guess, to what we wanted to, to say. And then COVID, I think, it highlighted a lot of interesting stuff, but uh, from from where I, uh, from you know, we, I think it's useful to start from COVID to capture the magnitude of what uh, the uh, urban to rural transition has been. To say, oh, look at that, you know. But there, my argument was, this is a sort of uh, everyday type of transition instead that you know, is at work regardless of COVID. In fact, for decades in the garment sector, since I've been studying it for sure. And uh, so in a sense, um, it's it, it, the people that lost their jobs uh, to COVID in different ways might find adjustments in the gig economy. Um, some of them, uh, well, some of them, in garment find jobs in PPE production. Uh, we sort of try to trace that too, but I doubt this would be kind of um, long-term transformation. So I'm not quite sure that uh, uh, the pattern, which is very much at work that you describe, Ananio, is, is relevant to uh, our case, particularly because we're looking at older workers. So these workers move back home by the age of 40. They will not take up work in the gig economy, which has a very sort of similar, if you want, setup of labor intensity as you would find in supply chain. So I think it's relevant to your question, but perhaps it's not exactly uh, attuned to, to the type of transition we looked at here. Yeah, no, but thank you. Like, I think it's a, an annual, it's a, yeah, very important question, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, this is a very complex <laughs> scenario. And uh, thank you to Alessandra and Costa for, yeah, picturing that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be like uh, 3,000 answers because there are like 3,000 variables involved in this. So <laughs> it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate as a final comment the fact that, uh, yeah, you're pushing a little bit the bound of uh, yeah our analysis by looking at this phase of uh, work and then I mean to be honest I never uh, looked many papers um, exactly uh, in investigating that so thank you very much and um, so uh, yeah I leave you uh, to the rest of your evening uh, and uh, afternoon uh, in sunny London or elsewhere and um, uh, thank you very much and uh, I'll uh, uh, we'll share the recording uh, with you uh, very soon. Bye bye. Thank Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.